Hello everybody. It is time for another live stream. So I wanted to get us started and of course get myself organized on this end as well. I hope you guys are having a good weekend and please let me know if my sound levels are good. Where is that live stream? Hi Alex. Kill my sound so we don't get feedback loop. Audio is good. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All righty. While that's doing its thing, and we are on the good Wi-Fi, <laughs> this week's topic is about measurements. And, you know, we talk about dosing a lot. I feel like I keep talking about it, and I don't know if you're sick of it or not, but I'm kind of tired of talking about it. But at the same time, when people say things like, my aquarium is this big and I add my sump and I add that, my skin starts to itch because it's bad, bad information. Um, and I'm going to explain why. And I'm not going to waste a lot of time. I want to get to the point and then move on to the next topic and then jump into your questions. Because last week I missed all the questions. I missed super chats. I was a terrible, terrible host. And I apologize in advance. When it comes to my own aquarium, I always want to know how much water is in it. And if you were working with your aquarium, and you do a water change and you suck out a certain amount of water, you can then tell how much water, um, I mean, you, just by glancing, you can realize it doesn't hold as much as they advertise. For example, a 90 gallon tank does not hold 90 gallons. My 400 gallon reef does not hold 400 gallons of water. So if somebody said, well, what is your total volume? And I said, well, it's a 400 gallon tank and I've got a 60 gallon enemy cube and I got 80 gallons in my sump you'd be thinking around 550, 580, and that's not the truth at all. Matter of fact, once I put in my layer of sand and I put in all the rock, and you take into account that the inside of the box is smaller than the outside of the box, you find out you don't have as much, nearly as much water as you think. So let's just do some quick math. Um, I want to prep it, but it's been a week. <laughs> so we're going to do math with me live right here live. So my tank is 84 inches by 36 inches by 30 inches. And I'm multiplying that out times, no, I'm sorry, divided by 231. <laughs> I want to make sure I was doing that right. Mathematically, that's 392 gallons. Uh, you can see, no, yeah, no, no, 392. And then I have an external overflow box that holds a couple of gallons. It puts me right at 400 gallons, but that's using outside dimensions. So let's do the same thing, but this time we're going to do inside dimensions. And I better write these numbers down because otherwise I'm going to really mess up this demonstration. My aquarium's walls are three quarters of an inch thick. So I have to take into account the thickness of the glass to get that inner measurement. Now, of course, if you have a dry tank, you can just measure the inside of your tank. And then the other thing is you cannot fill your tank to the top, it's usually under a plastic trim, or if it's a rimless tank, you're only going up to about this far from the top anyway. So that's a couple of inches you're burning right there that is not actually liquid volume. So if we take away 1.75 from the total length, because the end of my tank is one inch thick and the viewing end is three quarter inch thick. And then we take away 1.5 inches because of the front and back being three quarters of an inch. And then the height, we have to guess, because I don't have that measurement handy. And there's, I think, one inch on the bottom. And then there's definitely one inch of your brace on the top. So that's two. Then there's an air gap about an inch. That's three. Um, and then the euro brace doesn't go to the top. It's down a little bit. So we could take away, hmm, let's just guesstimate at 3.5 inches down. All right, so now we've got new numbers at... You're like, wow, I signed in for this. 82.25 long by 34.5 by 26.5. And it might not even be quite that high. So now, <clears throat> what is the total internal water volume of just the aquarium alone, not including the external overflow box? Eighty-two point two five. I'll just say it out loud so you can hear the formula. Times 
34.5 times 26.5 divided by 231, that ends up saying that my inside area of my aquarium mathematically measures at 325 gallons. Nowhere near 400 gallons. All right? And originally, I told you it was, uh, let me do my math again, 30, uh, 84 times 36 times 30 divided by 231. That was at 392.7. 392.7 minus 325. I'm missing 67 gallons of liquid water volume. That is a valid number. Now you're like, well, who cares? You know, so what? Well, it matters a lot when you're dosing certain products. And here I'm talking about dosing again. But if you were to use lanthanum, and it says to use 5 milliliters per 20 gallons, and you said, well, my tank holds 400 gallons when it really holds 325, you are overdosing a product. So we want to know that number. And now I didn't even take into consideration how much that sand bed equals and how much the rock displaces. So it was one of the easiest ways to determine how much water in your tank actually physically is, besides all this crazy math that I'm asking you to do, would be to drain all the water down to the sand bed one time into a receptacle that you can measure. Like if you had a few 55 gallon trash cans, for example, or 33 gallon trash cans, and you did 33 and 33, and you got down to the sand, and you're like, well, I have 99 gallons of water in this aquarium. It does not hold 120, it holds 99. And then you know, your tank has 99 gallons of water. And there is some water throughout the sand, but you know how that works. Sand is moist, it's not like soaking wet. And as you scoop it out, it's wet sand. And anyway, we want to get an accurate number. And then the same thing, and so what I usually tell people, unless you have some really unusual or unique setup, I tell people what you've got going on is whatever is in the sump usually will make up for what you took out in rock and sand. So if you're running a reef tank with a sump, typically, you know, whatever the tank size is, that's your water volume. Uh, I, I hope that makes sense to you, and, you know, if it doesn't, feel free to ask questions. And by the way, I wanted to look up liters <laughs> because I know this is an international conversation. And what I learned from reading a website, and I didn't try it out, I actually kind of wanted to try the math before I got on the live camera, but it said take your length times width times height in, in centimeters, and then divide it by a thousand, and that would give you the total liters the tank can hold. So feel free to let me know if that's accurate, because I'd, I'd love to know if that's true. And then that way you will know how much to dose per liter to your aquarium. For us in the U.S., we use gallons, and so we want to know how much to use per gallon. And that includes using certain foods, uh, lanthanum, phosphate RX, uh, Pradibio not so much because the vials have a huge range. But also knowing the water volume of your system helps you determine what skimmer to buy because the skimmer will be rated 135 to 185 gallons. And if your tank is a 250, so you think, well, I need this bigger skimmer. But if you really only have 175 gallons of water, maybe you can go down to a skimmer that's only for 200 gallons. So you see, it does matter what size tank you have, and it is good to know this kind of math. So I would definitely encourage you to get accurate measurements when it comes to that. Now, I've already skipped so much of the chat. I apologize. And I told you I was going to try to keep you guys in here. So get, oh, here we go. Uh, Douglas, I am not watching any game. I am a reef keeper. Wow. Harkins Aquatics says the true volume versus real volume is huge. His tank is a 32, but it only has 18.4 gallons of liquid. Let's see. And yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, how do I drag this over? Hmm. This has been a very busy week for me, and I actually was just out of town. I got back like two mornings ago after flying all night, and it was, keep that story. It's boring. I, I'm back, okay? <laughs> but I leave again. I, I, I'm bouncing around. So it's time, It's cutting into my editing schedule, and when I'm, as soon as I got back, I got some rest, and then I turned around, and I got on my workbench and started gluing things and building things for customers and getting orders out. 
because that's what pays the bills. That's what pays the, <laughs> the oral surgeon I keep mentioning to you guys. So I have to take care of customers first and videos second. And then I get to, you know, sleep. <laughs> but yeah, so, and then this week, while I'm actually working on Tammy's video, I get a message from her saying, uh, we need to reshoot. And I asked her why, and she said, well, you know, I saw a lot of questions from the original video we need to answer, which I think we did. And so I told her, you know, I think this video will be fine, and then we'll do another video for the five-year anniversary, which is next April, which is in, you know, four or five months. So, um, so yeah, as soon as I can get that thing uploaded, I will be super happy that I'll get 20 gigs off my hard drive, and that's really important to me. I'm trying not to shake this desk too much because I'm using the camera that's on this uh, laptop today. I left my tripod in another state, and I'm missing it right now, so that kind of threw me for a curve. Uh, well, you know, Andrew, I'm going to drop this in here. I understand about being mad, uh, but... What they're doing is they're giving you outside dimensions when you buy an aquarium. Almost every aquarium is sold that way, rather than internal volume. And, you know, that could be the case with a lot of things. I honestly do not know. I, you know, when I go buy groceries and it says you're getting this, you're getting that, I don't know if that includes the jar. I don't know if that's the contents. I don't know if the contents under perfect conditions went left, but it's not what you get when you walk into the store and get it. You know, I don't know. And actually, I probably don't want to know, because then I'd be more upset. I remember the good old days when you got a huge box of cereal, and it didn't cost a lot. <clears throat> and then the price kept going up. I thought, my goodness, this is just cereal. And then after a while, they came out with lower prices. Like, okay, finally, thank God. And then I realized the boxes were much smaller, and we're getting a lot less cereal for the cheaper amount. So, you know, let's, let's not delve into that, because we will go down a rabbit hole we won't be able to come back out of. Uh, here's a great question. What is better, to over or to underdose? I'm going to say always to underdose because you can always add more. But if you put in too much, there's very little you can do in an emergency. So, for example, uh, one of my friends recently overdosed his tank with a product trying to remove phosphate. And he uh, used a Sea Clear, which is the stuff sold by Pool Supplies because he knew some people use it, and they've been using it a long time, and he trusted them, and he used too much. Now, instead, if he had used less or even half of what was recommended, he could have done a dose and seen how his tank did, and then a couple days later, dose again, and bring the, the situation, you know, bring the phosphates down and down and down, instead of trying to hit it all at once. And especially with a brand new product he'd never used before, because he had not, he did the research, he watched my video, he, you know, saw this guy's reef, and he said, you know, man, I, I should do that. That sounds awesome. But he ended up losing three beautiful fish, and he was really upset to the point of breaking down his tank. He said, you know, I'm just going to take a break from the hobby. And I told him, basically, you know, you, you learned the hard way. Number one, I told him, I highly recommend buying things for the aquarium trade and not using something from somewhere else. And I know occasionally I break that rule. Like, for example, I tell you to use baking soda which is, you know, Arm & Hammer stuff, instead of going and buying the uh, professional aquarium. Like, eh, yeah. But, I mean, that's not my normal... That is one of the one things I do. You know, I buy white vinegar, I buy baking soda, I buy muriatic acid. I think everything else I buy is made for the aquarium. And that's why I love Phosphate RX. Uh, it, it's not a horror story. You drip it in the tank, you count the drops, and then you're done. It's so easy. And that's why I've been telling people for a long time and wondering for about 10 years, why doesn't everyone use this? Why is everyone using GFO? But anyway, he did not use Phosphate RX. He used C-Clear, and uh, he used a little too much, and he overdosed the tank, and his tank turned cloudy, and his rasses died before his eyes, and he was very upset. So if you underdose, you can basically sneak up on a problem, gradually solving it, rather than overdosing and harming the livestock. That was a long-ass answer for a, a quick question. Um, thank you for liking my plush toy. I am trying to remember where I got it. I remember I saw it, I was like, I gotta have that, and I bought it instantly. But man, I don't remember where I was when I got it. But yeah, I had to get myself a nice ginormous dory. I mean, that is, you know, that is so me.
and I'll never give it away. <laughs> All right. Um, I like the idea of putting a Machna in Texas, but I don't know when that will be. That is completely up to Masna. We do know next year it's in Florida, so if you have not purchased a, uh, a full conference pass, you should buy it now because every month that goes by, the price goes higher and higher and higher. And then you still have to add airfare and hotel. So buy it now. And the nice thing is if you absolutely cannot go, you can sell your ticket. So you're not going to lose your money. Tactical Tim asked me if I got any good deals for Black Friday. I did not. I totally ignored Black Friday. And I may be speaking to you, but I'm not speaking about you. <laughs> so. All right. Now, uh, that dimensional thing was really quick. I want you to know the formula. Let's see if I can add that to the screen somehow. How do I do that? Text. And let's see if this comes up on the screen. Hey, okay, it did. It's a little small, but you can read it, right? I'm going to move it. I'm going to try to move this down onto my black shirt so you have a good background. So length times width times height divided by 231 equals total gallons. Learn that formula for the rest of your life. Take a screenshot. <laughs> do what you got to do. But it's a really important one. I use it all the time. When people say, I want a top-off container, can you build me one? I ask them, well, what size do you want? And almost always they tell me the gallons. I want seven gallons. I want nine gallons. I want 15 gallons. And what I mean is how much space do you have to put this? And I'll figure out what you know size to make it to match the gallons. So if they say, well, I've got six inches wide and 18 inches deep, then I will use that formula and I'll figure out to get higher and higher and higher to hold as much liquid as possible in that narrow area. So that way they have the right amount. I also use this formula when I'm trying to figure out my dosing containers that I build for customers that hold the alkalinity, the calcium, and the magnesium. And so I have two sizes on my website. One holds a gallon per compartment, and then one holds one and a half gallons per compartment, which is kind of convenient for those of you with a bigger tank, obviously, but also if you've already got some solution made, but you need to refill it and it's not time yet, or you know they're kind of low, you could still mix up a gallon and pour it in because you've got the extra space. So that's why I have the two sizes. And actually, if you're thinking about buying one, you should buy it soon because I am going to raise the prices on those because I am grossly undercharging on those things. They're a lot of work. They hold a lot of liquid. And if I compare them to what everyone's selling on the market, they're uh, I'm undercharging. So that price is going to change soon. Heads up. Um, <clears throat> so I'll pull this off the screen. We don't have to look at it anymore. Now, like I said, for metrics, it's going to be length times width times height in centimeters divided by a thousand to give you total liters and that way you'll know how many liquid liters are in your aquarium so i hope that that helps all of you around the world with knowing how much liquid is in your aquarium uh, how much is in your aquarium and your sump and then you some people will say well what about the water and the plumbing uh, yeah i mean you could get it down to every drop you really want to have some fun with math but basically <clears throat> like i said my general rule would be whatever the tank is that's your total. Now with me, I, I, as I told you, I have a 400 gallon and I have a 60 gallon and I have a huge sump. And yet I say my total volume is 450 gallons. And that's probably pretty close. So if I were to try to actually get it down to the, you know, to the ounce, it might be less than that actually, not more. So. All right, I want to talk about something else. <coughs> yeah, I know. This is not the most interesting topic in the world, but I am jumping around. Um, the next topic, <coughs> excuse me, I wanted to talk about was the mighty tiger tail cucumber. So let me see if I can pull this up on the screen for you. We'll see which screen we get. Okay, good, perfect. Hey, and I'm on the screen still. That's nice. All right, so 
The tiger tail cucumber is a great cleanup crew critter. And the reason I want to talk about cucumbers today is because for some reason, some people have bad experiences with cucumbers. And that really should not be the case. Cucumbers are pretty awesome. I actually did some Googling and I typed in tiger tail cucumber Milev and most of these are my pictures, imagine that. So I'm gonna pull up some of these. Um, there's one on the glass right there, which is kind of unusual. And then on this one here, it was actually crawling out of my leather coral. I had a toadstool leather and there's more pictures of it somewhere here. Oh, I might have to hit back because I saw them all at first. Oh, here it is. So this is kind of a funny moment in my tank years ago. So let me scoot this over a little bit. I am in the way. How do I move myself? Can I do this? All right. So this toadstool leather was massive. And the tiger tail cucumber decided to hike on through and went down inside and down the side and up the glass and around a vortex pump and all that. Now, the reason people are concerned about cucumbers is they hear the stories that it will kill your tank. So I wanted to get into that, and I really wanted to get your feedback. So when you're doing the live chat now, you can discuss it. And also those of you watching it after the fact, if you'll type in the comments your personal experience, I would love to hear, and again, your personal experience, not something you read or something you heard, what has happened with you and cucumbers, and what type of cucumber it was. Because the tiger tail cucumber, as far as I am considered, is the most benign cucumber, and it's awesome. I bought one cucumber, I believe in, oh, I'm going to say, man, 2005 maybe, 2004, I've never bought one again, and I have at least nine right now in my reef, and they will split themselves over time, let's see, I want this to change, change to that one. So you got this spiky looking creature. It's about the thickness of a finger. And it usually likes to be, you know, holding onto the rock work and stretch out and it'll eat the sand. It has these little mop heads that come out. And I do have pictures of that somewhere because I've taken pictures of it in the past and I knew Google would pull it up for me because they're so helpful. But yet now that I need it, I don't see it. Um, but it brings up these mops that it will, maybe this picture here, uh, what did I pick? No, you still really can't. Well, you can kind of see the mop heads right here on the edge. Um, and so it would mop the sand, and it eats the sand, and it poops out clean sand out the other end. Normally, they're on the sand bed all the time, you know, usually in the rock work, and then they stretch out, and then they go back in. And if you lift up a coral or you lift up a rock, boom, a cucumber comes out. And over time, as the cucumber gets too large, which I don't know what too large would really be, honestly. I, I've seen them to be around 10 inches or so. And... At some point, they will literally choose to tear themselves in half, and there's two, and now you've got two instead of one. I didn't frag it. It's self-fragged, which is kind of awesome. And that's how I end up with, like, nine. And I've given a few away to some people over the years. So all said over the last 13 or 14 years, I've probably had 20 all from this one cucumber that I put in my tank. So what is the risk? What is the, the fear? There is words being said that these cucumbers get sucked into a power head and get shredded and then poison the tank. So I wanted to know, has that happened with you with this species of cucumber or has it happened with a different species of cucumber? And if so, which one was it? You know, is it the big giant black one? Is it the, the hot pink one? Is it the little tiny yellow ones that never move? Or was it like this one, the tiger tail? Because I've seen, like I said, my tiger tails are almost always on the sand. And I can walk down the tank at night and I can count them one by one. They're all sticking out. They're all looking for food, at, you know, during lights out. And during the daytime, I'll see one or two. And sometimes people even say, what is that thing? Because it looks funny from an angle. And they're just like, what is that curiosity? So here's another older picture I have one. Um, here's a different type of cucumber. I'm just going to pull this up even though it's not my image. It's because Google, we're on Google right now. So and that's pretty blurry. Now it's from a Wikipedia page. Um, here's a selling page, probably. And here's an interesting looking one that was probably seen in the ocean. Yep. But this is mine that I like, and so I, I recommend it. And I've seen them go up the glass, I've seen them hug my Vortec and then crawl away, and occasionally I've seen one go into the Vortec pump. And it isn't like it went into the, the fins, it actually went in face first into the propeller <laughs> and tore itself up. 
and it didn't affect my tank whatsoever. So perhaps the size of your aquarium, you know, or the lack of size, affects you more so than someone like myself with a huge tank, where I can get away with murder, so to speak, and not have it uh, affect water quality or kill my fish. So I wanted to get into that because when someone mentions cucumber in a group or a forum, there always seems to be one or two people that come out and they're like, oh my god, oh, I, I gotta warn you. And I almost feel like it's the same two people on the planet that had a bad experience and they're telling everyone, so everyone's terrified of cucumbers. And I just don't think we should be scared of them. I think they're awesome and they should be a, a normal part of your crew. You don't need many. Uh, and you can have one that'll last you forever. And it may never become more than one. I, I've just been lucky with these that I've gotten so many. And I've never had to go buy another one in my life, which is great. Because when I set up a new tank, I'll take some and put them in the other tank. I'll take some and put them in the refugium to keep that sand clean. I take some and put them in the frag system. And, you know, I, I just never seem to run out of them. But there are certain things, and I actually wanted to research this one as well, and I'll throw it out there for you. There's an animal out there called the sea apple. Absolutely gorgeous. When I was a kid, my dad had one in his aquarium, and I spent hours staring at this thing. I love the look. And, you know, I'm kind of halfway tempted to get one for my reef because they don't move a lot, and they filter feed from the water, and they're beautiful, but everyone says they're a hand grenade in your reef tank, and it's just a matter of when it'll explode and kill your livestock. And I'm very curious if that's even the case anymore. Is that a real risk, or is that just one of those myths that's been around forever and we just accept it? So I want to encourage you guys to do some research, try to find a fact from fiction when you're deciding what to purchase, and uh, don't necessarily let people terrify you, because if... Well, I mean, it seems to be working. Everyone's terrified of everything because people are setting up tanks with dry sand, dry rock, and then they want to only introduce every living thing they've chosen, whether it's a fish or it's a coral, but it cannot have a worm, a bug, a speck of dust. <laughs> it's got to be pristine, and that's just not reality. If I uh, ever get around to buying another dog... Sure, I'll give it a bath or I'll get it groomed or whatever, but it's going to walk outside and it's going to track things on its paws and it's going to bring a flea into my house or, or, you know, whatever. Or maybe a lizard in its mouth like Jake did, my old Cocker Spaniel. And, you know, you just, things happen. It's life. And when we buy corals and we put them in our tank and all of a sudden we have amphipods or micro brittle starfish, those are good things. That's not something to be frightened of or think they're going to destroy your tank. There are certain pests that will annoy you and you will spend time eradicating them, and you'll wish you'd never introduced them, and I understand that. But at the same time, I've never had that problem in my tank. I've never felt like, oh my god, why did I do such and such? I just was like, oh man. And I dealt with it until I got the problem resolved, which I think my worst situation was acroreading flatworms. And even then, I didn't lose a lot of sleep over it. I just dealt with it. So I'm recommending the same to you to enjoy the reef, enjoy the diversity, not be scared of things. You know, if you go to the fish store, look for the tiny things. That's what I love to do. When I go into fish stores, I'm not, I mean, yeah, if they have a great display tank, that's awesome. I mean, that's eye candy. But I tend to go look for the tiny compartments, and I want to see what's in the, all those little cubbies. And they might have pom-pom crabs, or they may have uh, an arrow crab, a little baby one. Or they'll have the golden coral banded shrimp. All these interesting creatures, sign me up. I like them. Matter of fact, I'd like to add a few to my tank, and I just haven't spent the money. But it's going to happen, and one day you'll be watching a video. I'm like, hey, I don't remember him mentioning that before, and there'll be something in there. So you'll see. So um, <clears throat> let's take a... F We're only... Man, we still have time. We're doing good today. I am staying on topic. Um, let's address some of your questions. I'm going to try and scroll back into this list and see what I can find. I'm trying to decide how to handle this thing. Where do we leave off? By the way, if you are new to my channel, please subscribe. <clears throat> Our channel has really grown since uh, I started this thing years ago. And we are, at this point, uh, around 46,000 subscribers or so. That's pretty awesome. Let's see. Yeah, you know, I'm going to throw this on the screen because it's funny. I look at some of your first videos and got some good laughs in. You know, I get some good laughs in, too. 
I've, I've heard uh, other YouTubers discuss, you know, their previous videos, and they ask, you know, which, what's your cringe-worthy video? What's the one that you regret the most? I really don't have a lot of regrets. I mean, everything I talk about is usually true. I, I like to be funny, and uh, you know, I try to keep it entertaining and, and light, and and allow you to absorb the information and decide for yourself if it makes sense and if you want to follow it. There are occasional things I will say that I'll regret later, and because it comes back to haunt me forever. Like, in the Cooking Live Rock video, I mentioned how it can remove Aptasia, and I should never have said that, because people keep saying, well, does it really get rid of them? I'm like, well, yeah, eventually it will, because with a lack of food source, things just die off completely. And the Aptasia that were on some rock that I had in a barrel for many years, yeah, they were gone. I didn't put them in my tank and suddenly have Aptasia again. But it, the video kind of gave you the perception that if you cook these rocks for a month or two, you won't have Aptasia, and that's not 100% accurate. I mean, you could, it, it, you could make that happen. <laughs> you could kill the Aptasia, cook the rock, and investigate, find any others, kill them too, and by the time you're done cooking, they're gone. But to just put them submerged in darkness and expect them to just evaporate would be uh, optimistic thinking and not very accurate. So I, that is one thing out of all my videos that I kind of regret saying. Everything else I stand by. <laughs> I see someone's commenting from India. I really appreciate that. And I do not know if I will be visiting, but I appreciate the open invitation you have just provided. Let's see. I'll just say, welcome to the live chat, Ben. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's talk about the tiger tail unique poop. That's a good one. And I don't know if I have any pictures of it. Let's see if I can find some um, that I might have taken. I have taken so many pictures over the years, it's easier to Google my stuff than it is to go check my own website. So, well. No, well, I don't see anything really quickly. I see one belongs to someone else. I don't want to get myself in hot water using someone else's material. So. It will look like compressed sand that look like little pellets. Uh, like, uh, kind of looks like hamster food. You know, these little pellets. And it's sand. And it is processed through the cucumber and comes out in little tic-tac-shaped pellets. And you'll just have a little mountain of these things. And of course, if you were to just hit them with a scraper or your fingers, because it's just clean sand, it'll just dissipate instantly. They don't stay that way. And that is exactly how a cucumber cleans your sand bed. So as it's eating with those mop heads and it sucks it into its body and it processes it and eats all the detritus, out comes clean sand. It is awesome to have these guys in there cleaning your sand bed for you automatically. And they're always cleaning the surface. And I've seen them travel through things. Uh, like I've seen them kind of push their way through cyano. They don't eat it. I wish they did. But I've seen them kind of work their way around it. They're not terrified of it. Now, if your tank has dinoflagellates, they could die. Because dinos are basically really toxic and it seems like nothing can eat that and live. Now, if there is something on this planet that eats dinoflagellates, I don't know what it is. Maybe some type of bacteria, but not like things we put in our tank. Here's an interesting question. Does your homeowner's insurance cover your home from damage if a tank failure occurs? And let's say we're, we're talking about a failure as in, you know, the tank exploded and water goes everywhere. Funny you should ask that because back in January, I'm sorry, July 3rd of 2010, my 280 gallon tank sprung a leak. It was a small, slow leak. It had been building up for a week and my carpet was damp in front of the tank and I assumed or attributed it to some recent rain. Like I tracked in moisture and the carpet was a little wet, but it was getting wetter. And I was like, oh no. And so I drained the tank. I had my friends come over, and we drained the tank on July 4th and moved all the livestock into temporary setup. And then I dealt with what had to be repaired, and I had to replace the tank. A year later, my dad said, did you make an insurance claim on that? And I looked at him, and I was like, no, why would I do that? 
He said, well, you had damage, didn't you? I said, yeah. I mean, I had to get somebody in here to clean the carpet. And he said, they probably would have covered that. And that never occurred to me. <laughs> I'm so self self-sufficient to a fault. I just handled it. So can your insurance cover you? What you would want to do is you want to talk to your homeowner's insurance or your renter's insurance and see what they'll cover. Typically, they will not cover livestock. What they will cover will be uh, materials. So if you bought a tank and the tank leaked, there is a potential that the tank would be replaced with a new one with your insurance minus the deductible. Uh, if your living room is flooded and your electricals get destroyed, you know, you know you've got your entertainment center and your PlayStation's on the floor and your uh, you know, the computer laptop was down there at the time and it just all gets flooded with water, yeah, that's an insurance claim. And they'll probably cover all that kind of stuff as long as you have receipts to prove you bought it all. But will it cover the livestock, which is pretty much the most expensive part for m many of us, you know, all the things we have. And then, you know, on top of that, the insurance can never cover the time that you've invested. So if you've, you know, grown your reef like I have for five years, and then the entire thing leaks and you have to start from scratch with frags, you can't get five years back. You can't re-get that growth back, and they will not pay for it either. So I would just kind of, you know, lick my wounds and start the rebuild, because that's what I do. I I never say die. I never stop. Uh, and I do have some good pictures of my tank leaking, by the way. <laughs> Did a full article about that breakdown, but uh, it's like eight or nine pages over on Reef Addict. It's a big, long ordeal. But that uh, big toadstool that you saw the cucumber in, that was from that tank. It took two of us to get that toadstool out of the tank. It was so heavy. All right, I'm going to answer this one because I love talking about phosphates. If my rocks are leaching phosphate, will phosphate RX be more beneficial or GFO? 100% positive phosphate RX. That is my go-to. And that is what I was kind of mentioning earlier. Like, why are more people not using phosphate RX? Why is everyone using GFO? Everyone swears by this stuff, and yet everyone's complaining about algae problems, and I am using Phosphate RX, and I have no algae problems. So, <laughs> it, it, mm, kind of drives me a little bit crazy. Honestly, I mean, I understand there's certain things that lead to growing algae, and new tanks go through algae phases. I get that. But controlling your phosphates with a GFO reactor did not work for me. That doesn't mean it's invalid. It just means it didn't work for me. There's people out there who can't make a protein skimmer work for them. There's people out there that can't grow anything in a refugium, but they love a turf scrubber. You know, so there's a lot of ways to accomplish the same thing in this hobby. But what I basically tell people is when it comes to phosphate, use phosphate RX and just suck it out of the system overnight. It's so simple because you don't have to set up a reactor. You don't have to rinse the GFO media, media to release all the fines and get them out. You don't have to make sure it's tumbling and check on it and make sure it hasn't solidified and have to replace it. And GFO is not inexpensive. It's pretty pricey stuff no matter who, what brand you're using. And you have to keep on top of it. But I know people like it, you know, the, the premise they like is that they can run this product in their sump, you know, in a reactor, 24 hours a day, and it's constantly binding up phosphate to export it from your system. That's the premise. And yet, a lot of you are telling me, I have zero phosphate, zero nitrate. Well, then you've taken up too much. So my tank, tends to be 0.1 ppm all the time. And if your phosphates get up to 3.0, which is a big number, you know, remember, we're trying to be 0 0.03, but if you're at 3.0, and that usually comes from an auto feeder dropping all the food in the tank at once, using nori every single day, those are what lead to higher phosphate numbers, then that point, the phosphate will get into your rock and into your sand, and then as you're exporting it, it keeps leaching out and leaching out and leaching out. And that has been my, my experience. I have had an auto feeder completely sink to the bottom of the tank because Spock pulled it in. And I happened to look right as it happened and the auto feeder was spinning as it went down to the bottom. It was still trying to dis, you know, uh, dispense food as it, and batteries, oh, it destroyed the thing. But uh, a whole month's worth of food went in the tank at once. You know, I took a fish net and tried to scoop out you know, flakes as best I could, but you couldn't. And phosphates were 3.0. I used Phosphate RX 
that day, and then I waited 48 hours and did it again, waited 48 hours, did it again, waited 48 I did it for two weeks. Every other day, I used Phosphate RX over and over and over and over until phosphates came out and stayed out. If you use Phosphate RX and then, you know, a couple days later, the number's back up, it's coming out of your sand and your rock, and you would need to treat again. And I have used, like I said, I normally use it every eight, ten weeks, and that's it. You know, so five times a year, maybe slightly more than that. I guess six <laughs> would be slightly more. So let's say I do it six nights out of a year of 365 days. That's 359 days I didn't have to do anything, which I love about that product, and that's why I've been recommending it for so long. And when I was in a situation where the tank had an overdose of food and I had to use it frequently, like, you know, what is that, five times in two weeks? Um, I did. And, you know, so what? Who cares? It's just product. And, you know, once it's used up, you buy another bottle. That's it. So that has worked really well for me, and it is what removed it from the system. And if you're dealing with it coming out of your rock or you're using old rock and the phosphate just won't seem to come down, yeah, I definitely would say phosphate RX. If I had trust every question this long, we would never be done with a live stream. This is an interesting question. Is it possible for fish to die from eating too large of a food? It is possible for a fish to choke on food. I remember many years ago, I had a clownfish that had his eyes were too big for his stomach. <laughs> and he saw this huge piece of food, and he just opened his mouth, and, and it was stuck, hanging out of his mouth, and swimming around. And he saw more food, and he was swimming toward the food to eat it, even though he had this big thing sticking out, and so it was acting like a cork. And he could not capture any more food, and yet he was chasing down every flake trying to get it. Couldn't get it past his mouth. And I was a little worried for him, and you know, I checked on him five minutes later, and he continued to be uh, stuck. You know, this food stuck in his jaw, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to have to save this fish from himself. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, man, you know, because, you know, when you think about catching any kind of fish in a reef tank, you know the fish is there, and he's going to be elusive. He's not going to like the net. And then you're worried about breaking your corals because you're going to snag the net on the corals. And so anyway, you know, these, these thoughts of despair are going through my head as I'm, you know, getting the net and I shoved in the water to catch this fish. And the fish saw that net and got so scared, he just coughed up the food and swam the other way. Problem solved. So it, <laughs> I got lucky on that one. But another weird thing that can happen, and I've seen pictures of it, so it's real, is that sometimes you will glue a frag to a frag plug and put it in your tank or glue the frag plug to the rock work and then you'll have an inquisitive fish like a tang swim up and nibble on the glue and glue their mouth shut. I've seen that. I've also seen, and this one was insane, I've seen a yellow tang that was swimming around that had a rubber band that went from its mouth all the way around its tail and back. Somehow it got into a rubber band. I don't even know how that's possible. And I don't know how they got the rubber band off that fish. Obviously, they had to catch it. I don't think he swam out of it at some point. But the gluing of the mouth shut, that would be that would make me very nervous. And basically, what will happen is over a period of about two or three days, that glue would flake off, and the, the fish will be okay. You know, <laughs> Assuming it's not starving in the first place, it should be okay. But that's a nutty one, and it can happen. But if a food is usually too big for a fish to get in its mouth at all, it'll either nibble at it or it'll ignore it. But if it gets stuck in their mouth, yeah, you're going to have to interact, I believe. <laughs> if this is true, we're all going to switch insurances today. <laughs> Hello, Rico. Rico has found his way to our live stream. You were promised nothing by me. I mentioned cucumbers. Aren't, aren't echinoderms um, starfish? By the way, the little tiny cucumbers <clears throat> that are bright yellow, they're so pretty. They find one spot in your tank and they stick out their little feathery appendages to filter feed and they never move. I mean, 
but kind of as boring a critter as you can get. Now, unless you just want some bright yellow and you want to put five or six of those in your tank, and those are so tiny, I don't think they could hurt a tank. Uh, even if they were in a small tank, I don't think they have the, uh, the girth to cause chaos with your tank. So I would say, you know, that's a nice one if you need some yellow in your tank and you're, you're wishing you had some and didn't have any. I see a question here. I'm going to try to address this. Struggling to keep SPS, all the parameters are okay, and I'm using two AI primes. I have a max spec gyre at 20%. All right, so. Uh, your parameters... You say they're okay. Anyone else in this industry is going to tell you, well, what are the numbers? So, what are the numbers? But let's assume all your reef parameters are dead on perfect. Your flow may be a little too slow, but you didn't, well, you said the tank's three feet, but you didn't really give me any other information. Um, we want to make sure there's adequate flow. We want to know what is going on with your SVS specifically. Are they just sitting there stagnant? Or are they dying? Are they dying instantly? Are they dying slowly? Is there a pest on them? Is the light running too long? Is the light too intense? SPS corals are a little tricky. I have a full article about this on my website about SPS care. And you can actually go, the easiest way is go to Critter ID and go to SPS corals, and it's the very first uh, Critter uh, slot is what I pick for SPS care. I'll show it to you really quick here. Let me pull this up for you. Switch screens one more time. So we will go... We'll get on the right screen. <laughs> go to Critter ID. And we'll go to SPS Corals. And what your SPS need what you need to know. So you just click on that guy right there. And you will get a full article about what these corals need. It's nice and long and newsy. Alright? So go read that and see if it helps you, because that is gonna be most of my information. I also have a live stream about SPS care that you can watch as well if you're a viewer slash listener. Stephen Liu, the best way to reach me is gonna be through my website on Contact Us. Click that, tell me what size you want to fit under your tank, and I will respond with a quote. I'll need to know where you're located too. That's important because of shipping. Uh, <laughs> I zip tied my auto feeder to the tank so it can't fall in. And yes, that would be smart. Mine was Velcroed, but I have a huge tank that pulled the entire assembly down into the tank because she was so excited to get a meal. So Spock can be a little aggressive. And that's what made me make a different type of feeder that barely penetrates the water so that way she can do whatever she wants, but it doesn't affect it. And I've never had that happen twice. Yeah. And it was on a temporary tank. That was after my tank leaked, and I had to set up a temporary 215 reef. And I set that up in the back corner, and, you know, it wasn't ideal. It wasn't supposed to be long-term. And, you know, things happen. Ah, oh, thanks, Andrea. Appreciate you sharing that link. Ah, okay. So the econon of derms that I can't say twice uh, included cucumbers. Cool. Dave wants to know why he can't keep green star polyps. There are certain corals that are kryptonite to us, and each of us runs into a problem. I'm going to state the most obvious thing that comes to mind, because they're a very easy coral. Is there any chance that you glued them upside down on the rock? Because that would kill them. Uh, if they are not right side up, you know, if you glue them face down onto the rock, you kill them. Uh, but... They really are a simple coral. They grow everywhere. They grow on the overflow box. They grow on your cleaning magnet. They grow on your rock. They'll cover the sand. I mean, they'll go anywhere you give them a chance. And if they're not growing, it's either going to be water quality or it's going to be lighting. I mean, that's usually the two things that make everything work or not work in a reef tank. Oh! I want to talk to you guys about safety style. Very important. Man, I should have started the video with this. I apologize. Okay, so I have about 30 customers that have ordered safety stop. They're waiting for it to come in. <clears throat> and it has been a very long wait. It has been two months <laughs> since I was completely depleted of my inventory. 
And I have been talking to Blue Live two or three times a week ever since, saying, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? Because people keep buying it. If you are wanting to buy any, buy it now from my website, because what's going to happen is I'm going to get in a huge shipment of it, and I'm shipping it to everybody. And I am like the first company in the U.S. to get the safety stop because I've been the loudest complainer. So <laughs> and uh, I sell it on my website. They're $5 a package. You can get 3, 5, 15, 20 packages, whatever you need, and I'll ship it to you. My website is going to charge you FedEx shipping, but if I can ship it for less, I will, and then I will send you the difference as a refund. So you're not losing any money, and literally, this stuff's going to arrive, and I'm going to be shipping it everywhere, and I cannot wait to just... I mean, I'm going to use the post office instead of FedEx because it's, you know, it's light. It's an ounce. I was up there at the post office yesterday asking, what is the maximum... Uh, I don't have one here, of course. Uh, I had these padded envelopes. <clears throat> you know, they're big. And I said, what is the maximum weight I can do with this postage? And they said up to 13 ounces. So I feel like I could put in five, six, eight, ten packages safely into one of those and ship it to you for about $3.50, which is a lot cheaper than when FedEx wants 13 to 17 to $18, depending where you are located. And I don't understand why I can't get a better rate from FedEx when it comes to super light objects, but these guys, you know, they just do their thing. So... If you're concerned about pricing on my website and you wish shipping was less on something, if it is something I can mail instead and save you money, I'm always happy to do that. And a lot of times I do that for my customers and they don't even ask. I just say, oh, you bought this? I can put that in a padded envelope. Here's $8 back. You know, because I understand saving money. And I've had a few customers say, Mark, are you kidding me? You think I'm worried about the $8? <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, I'm just being honest. <clears throat> so if you want to buy some safe stuff, please do. I will add you to my list. I have this master list of people waiting, and uh, I will be happy to fill that order. I'd like to. I want to be the one guy that sells all fifty thousand packages. That's what I want to do. Uh, it's not realistic, but it's a nice dream. So yeah, they are. They are literally making fifty thousand packages. I have been sending emails to my customers, giving them updates because we've really had to wait a long time, and uh, they are almost done. And so they're going to be shipping soon. So if you're if you've been wanting to get some, and for some reason. A lot of people have been ordering from me lately, and I guess it's because you just can't find it anywhere in the nation. I mean, nowhere. So everyone's coming to my website and ordering it, and they're just on the wait list. And that, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because as soon as it arrives, I'm sending it out, and you won't have to wait another extra day. So, uh, Let's see. Something off topic. <clears throat> Digitate hydroids. Um, <clears throat> they're on my critter ID. And do you have a... Let me ask you this, William. Do you have a lot of them? Or do you have a few? And what are they irritating, first of all? Because that is a valid question. The digitate hydroid comes out of a little tiny hole in your rock work. I'm trying to find it right now. Of course, I went... See, to me, they're not a pest. So they're not on the pest section of my website. <laughs> So they're going to probably be in worms, I think. <clears throat> and uh, I had a few. But since they come out of a tiny hole, you can glue the hole shut with a drop of super glue, and that'll solve the problem. Well, I'm going to have to do a search for these darn things. I can't find them anywhere. Yeah, not under worms either. Mm. But, uh, yeah, digitate hydroids, they're not a big deal. I think we're talking about the same creature. There are hydroids. That's a totally different thing. And they cause chaos. The digitate ones, they're more like a fishing line. You know, they're like fly fishing, looking for food in the water, and then they jerk it back in, and they send it back out, and they jerk it back in. And, you know, sealing the hole is usually the simplest solution for that one. All right. Chiron is talking about his SPS corals that are dying. Um, definitely do the... Do read that article over and do your water test. Make sure that your numbers are correct. Matter of fact, have your fish store double check your water. Like, test your water, then take the water to the fish store and have them test it and compare their numbers to yours and make sure that you're getting accurate results. I have done that. I've tested my tank, something wasn't right, and I took my water to the fish store down the street and said, please confirm my numbers. And they did, and, you know, then I had to figure out what was going on. But that's the best way. Ten hours a day is a little bit long, but you are ramping up and down. So that should be a factor. It could be the lights are too close to the water. It could be the lights are too intense. It could be the coral is too high up. I know we like to put SPS up higher, but I, I mentioned in a recent video, I always start them at the sand and leave them there. So as soon as I get it, I dip it, and it goes on the sand, and I don't touch it and leave it alone. 
And I would tell you to do that with the next SPS you buy. Dip it, put it in the bottom of the tank, and ignore it. You know, don't touch it. Don't do anything unless you have to, like, fix it because then you knocked it over. Other than that, leave it alone and just let it settle and see how it does. And if it does well, then your tank's okay. And so what is causing the problem? Maybe it's even your dip that's killing them. You know, it's just too strong. How much did you spend on your tank itself? I have no idea. I don't like to track those kind of numbers. I track a lot of numbers, but that's one I don't track. It's a lot. And I probably spend about $200 a month maintaining it. What do I think of the Kessel 360X? They are beautiful. Uh, they're very sleek looking. I had a customer order one recently and I shipped it to him and I got to see them in person at Macna and at Reefapalooza. Really pretty, uh, but I have no hands-on experience. But they look really good. The only thing that I wish they had right now, which I don't believe they do yet, is some kind of Wi-Fi compatibility. For now, you have to wire it, you know, like one light to the next and then to the director. And with the stuff that we see from other light fixtures these days, to have an app you can just open up. Like the AP700 from Kessel uses an app. Why that app's not talking to these things, I don't know, but I would hope that they would add that ASAP because that app is really nice. Um, <clears throat> would you ever link a live feed of your aquarium so, <laughs> so we can check in on Spock? I've kind of toyed with that thought a little bit. Um, some people have webcams set up where people can log in and they can check on the tank, you know, or, or yeah, they can see the tank depending what time of day it is, if the lights are on. And I've kind of toyed with that thought. It would be sitting on my upstream all the time. And uh, as you know, I use the internet for my business. And so I kind of like to keep the Wi-Fi channels empty at all times. But who knows? There could be a chance some point where I might do something like that or find something that I like. Um, that's the answer. Vermited snails are sort of like uh, hydroids. They are a problem, and in some tanks they're a real problem. They typically will thrive in an environment with a lot of nutrients. So if your tank has too many nutrients, you're going to have a lot of vermitids. And breaking them off and putting in something to eat them, like break off the tubes, and then put in like hermit crabs and arrow crabs and corban shrimp and... Uh, That's the critters I would use. And then uh, super glue gel to seal the hole shut is one trick. Another trick is to take, I mean, it all comes down to how manual you want to get. If I was really upset with a rock, <laughs> if I had a rock just covered with these things, I would remove the rock from my system and go to the sink and I would start breaking off all the vermitids and then seal all the holes and then put it back in my tank. Yeah, that's how I handle it. I would not sit there and soak it in bleach. I wouldn't dip it in acid. I wouldn't do any of that. Uh, it would have to be a massive infestation. I mean, like a porcupine with thousands upon thousands, then I might just get a different rock and just call it a day. But there's a few in my tank right now, and I totally ignore them. What lighting would you recommend for a 40 breeder softy LPS tank? Any kind of lighting would be fine for that. Uh... LEDs are the preference these days. Lumalite from ReefBright would be a nice, simple, sleek light that would be plenty good for LPS corals. Um, you could get yourself one of these Kessel 360s we just talked about. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in using T5 bulbs, you can do that, but you have to buy the bulbs every year. So there's the cost involved with that. And you have to deal with what kind of fixture do you want to look at, too, on top of this tank? Are you doing a canopy that encloses it? Is it going to be hanging down from thin little wires? You know, I mean, it, it's going to come down to also the look you want to, you know, appreciate over your tank. And we are coming up now in an hour. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Let's see if there's any more questions I can answer before I end this. I have considered all kinds of nifty ideas. Matter of fact, I saw a really cool thing that Jake Adams did on Reef Builders the other day, and I want to steal his idea. He stood in front of a television, and he had his slides come up. And that way, he uh, 
Yeah, it was really nice. And I was like, man, why did I never think of that? Because I have a television right there that's huge, and I could just turn the cameras that way, and if I can kill the reflections, that would be really good. And to be honest, all I wanted to have on there was my screensaver running in the background because it's mostly all my pictures plus some pictures of other people's that I liked and I saved to my hard drive. And it's all reef related and it comes up my screen all the time whenever a TV show is paused and I love it. And I thought, oh, if I just stood next to that and talked, it wouldn't be as boring as, you know, the static stuff here. You would actually have a lot of my pictures come up on the screen. But I would have to go through and remove the pictures that belong to other people so I don't get myself in hot water with someone saying, that's mine. So if I, but I take so many, I think I could load it up. <laughs> I think I could come up with my own set of screensaver images enough that would keep you guys happy. Um, Cause like right now, as I said, it already looks nice. I would just have to pull out some really killer shots that I personally enjoy that uh, are not mine. And uh, so, you know, like divers, they take beautiful shots. And it's like, oh yeah, I want to save that. And I stick it in a, in a folder and then, you know, I forget about it. And then one day my buddy said, hey, you know, you can make that your screensaver. I'm like, no, it never even occurred to me. And I've done that with my television with Apple TV and it's been awesome. And half the time I stop and just look at the screen. It's funny because I want to hit the show to continue, but I'm really enjoying the pictures. So, yeah, I, I kind of thought maybe I could do that while I'm talking to you guys during a live stream. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Please post your live stream videos or audios to a podcast. I like listening to them during a long drive. Um, I've actually thought about how to do something like that, and it's probably going to happen. So, yeah. I mean, I don't... What are you guys doing right now during your long drive? Do you just play the YouTube video and just don't look at it? I'm curious how you guys handle that. All right, guys, um, it, is test, it is water test Saturday, so make sure you test your water parameters and post those results. You can post them on uh, Club Me Loves Reef. I'd love to see them there. Or you can post them on Instagram and do hashtag water testing, hashtag post your results. Always do the at Me Loves Reef. I would love to see how you're doing and how your tanks are doing. Matter of fact, if you guys are in Club Me Loves Reef, let's start a new thread today. Let's just post pictures of our tank because it's a new month. And let's just see what everyone's tank looks like right now today. And I'll, I posted some pictures on my Instagram last night. I've got my Christmas tree standing in the way, and it's blocking part of my view. And I put up a few pictures because it kind of amused me. But uh, I can't wait to have it all glowing with lights and, you know, the ornaments. And it'll be really nice because it reflects off the front of the tank, which is kind of neat. You see the little spots of light, the little twinkles. I really enjoy that this time of year. So I would definitely want you guys to test your water, make sure that all your parameters are solid, that you know what to dose or what to stop dosing because the numbers are getting too high. And I just saw someone recently say, I haven't been testing, and I've just been doing water changes, and all of a sudden I discovered everything was too high, and my response was, I'm glad you tested. So get in the habit of testing. Instead of everyone running GFO, everyone should test their water. Now that is a good goal. <laughs> I'm just not a GFO guy. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'm going to wrap up this thing because, you know, I, I talked about it, I didn't really finish that thought. Running GFO is designed to remove the phosphate all the time or keep it nice and low all the time. My method is to let the phosphates elevate and then drop them and elevate and drop them and elevate and drop them. And you know what? My reef loves me. So I don't think that my method is a bad example to you at all. It is definitely one that's worked fine for me. Oh, I use the word fine. Worked well for me for the last 10 plus years. And I don't let them get too high. I measure the water. It's 0.1, I ignore it. It's 0.25, I'm like, eh. It's 0.5, I'm like, fine, I'll put in some phosphate RX, and I knock it back down to close to zero. And then, you know, I just let it gradually build up over the next eight, ten weeks. So, it, you know, the numbers are going to go higher based on how much food you throw in the tank. And those of you that are running GFO because you want to stay like 0.03 to 0.07 all the time, I understand that control freak desire you want, but your reef may not need that pristine exact number all the time if it did uh, then my reef would be dead <laughs> so i would just say you know whatever works best for you stick with it if gfo makes you happy and you know your numbers are good and your corals are doing well don't change anything because i suggested it but if you're dealing with stuff or you're sick of algae or you don't like the high phosphates or whatever and you want to try phosphate rx you know i sell it on my website and i've been selling it for years and i really i mean i sell it because i love it and i use it myself so I would definitely recommend using that to knock them down. And then if you want to go to GFO between doses, you could, but why? I don't. So why would you? <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about it. 
All right, guys. That's it. Um, as I said, I've got another trip about to happen, and uh, it's going to cut into my editing time. And today, I'm supposed to see my son. He, he just had his birthday. And so I'm going to go celebrate with him. And then I think tomorrow I'll be building some stuff that has to ship out first thing Monday because I'll be out of town. And uh, because of that, I... Um, not sure when I have time to edit the Tammy video, but I want it gone. I want it on there. So, I mean, just because you bring it up doesn't mean it's going to happen any quicker. I appreciate that you care, and I want it done just as much as you do, believe it or not. And it's just a matter of having the time. So, that's it. I hope you have a great weekend with your families, and your reef tanks stay nice and happy and bubbly for you. Bye, guys.